لكن الحمد لله قبل بثلاث سنين كان واقف الدان اللي على نيسان ما اكتفى بالنيسان بس كمان جاب الميتسوبيتشي ومن هون كبرت الدنيا كلها وما بدنا بدي اترك الكلام طبعا بس هيدي على نجاحاته اللي بيفتخر فيه كل لبناني وانا بحب اهلكم بهالموقع الجديد للنقابه اللي الله يرحمه ريمون نجار هو تبرع بهذا تاهيل هذا البناء وشكرا Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to uh, thank you for taking the time to be here with many of you traveling great distances to join me. Ça c'est le seul endroit où je vais parler en plusieurs langues. Je voudrais aussi uh, uh, saluer uh, nos amis de la presse française qui nous ont rejoints. وأنا حبيب كمان سلم على كل أصدقاء اللبنانية أنا اليوم فخور كون لبناني لأنه إذا إذا في بلد بالعالم وقف معي بهالصعوبات هو لبنان. As you can imagine, today is a very important day for me. One that I have looked forward to every single day for more than 400 days. since I was brutally taken from my world as I knew it, ripped from my family, my friends, my communities, from Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi, and the 450,000 women and men who comprise those companies. I have not experienced a moment of freedom since November 19, 2018. It is impossible, it is impossible to express the depth of that deprivation and my profound appreciation to once again be able to be reunited with my family and loved ones. Today is also a poignant reminder of the day precisely one year ago when I appeared before many of you as well as a Japanese judge and prosecutors in Tokyo. I pleaded my innocence by a did so while constrained by handcuffs and bound by a leash around my waist, which was used to walk me into the courtroom. I was in the midst of being held indefinitely in solitary confinement after several attempt, failed attempts at bail. I had just spent the Christmas and New Year holiday alone and in confinement, and I hadn't spoken to or seen my family for six weeks. My only contact with them were letters shown to me by lawyers through a looking glass. I had spent the previous months being interrogated for up to eight hours a day without any lawyers present, without an understanding of what exactly I was being accused of, without access to the evidence that justify this travesty against my human rights and dignity. It will get worse for you if you don't just confess. The prosecutor told me repeatedly, and this has been taped. You can look at the tapes because the tapes are being held. You can see how many times they came up about, you know, you just confess and it will be over. And if you don't confess, not only we're going to go after you, we're going to go after your family. And we're going to discover many things. Every day I woke up on nights that I was able to sleep and to make a decision. Do I fight for my innocence or do I do as they say? And there was no end in sight. And those conditions remained more or less the same day after day, week after week, month after month. The feeling of hopelessness was profound. And every day for over 130 days in detention, I fought for my innocence. 
When I was finally granted bail for the first time and saw the opportunity to share with you all what I intend to share today, I was restlessly thrown back in solitary confinement within 24 hours, a confinement that flies in the face of global and United Nations standards of justice. This is why today is such an important occasion for me. I'm not here to talk about how I managed to leave Japan, although I can understand that you are interested in that. I'm here to talk about why I left. For the first time since this nightmare began, I can defend myself, speak freely, and answer your questions. It was very easy to beat on me while I was in prison. It was very, very easy to describe me the way I was described. Unfortunately, not only in Japan. But now I'm going to be able to speak with facts and data and evidence, and hopefully you will discover the truth, not as it has been travestied by the people who are accusing me, or the people who join this accusation, or the accomplices, not only in Japan, but outside Japan. But the reality is very different, and hopefully today you're going to discover it with me. I'm not here to victimize myself. I'm here to shed light on a system that violates the most basic principles of humanity. I'm here to clear my name and to pronounce clearly and emphatically something that was interpreted as a heresy in the Japanese judicial system. These allegations are untrue and I should have never been arrested in the first place. First, I would like to begin by expressing my profound gratitude to those who supported me during this unspeakable ordeal. In the face of a systematic campaign by a handful of malevolent actors to destroy my reputation and impugn my character. I'm grateful beyond words for the steadfast love and support of my family, my wife, Carol, my four children, my three sisters, my mother, Rose, Carol's children and family, they all endured unimaginable pain. They learned of my arrest and solitary confinement through the media. They were barred from seeing me or even speaking to me for months. They were targeted by relentless, shameless, baseless media attacks orchestrated by Japanese prosecutors, Nissan executives, and unfortunately many accomplices. I think of my supportive friends as well as the numerous anonymous individuals who sent me letters of support while I was in the detention center of Kosuge. I think of the Lebanese authorities and citizens who never lost their faith in me. They showed the world that for a small country, Lebanese people have a big soul, they have a big heart, and the true sense of righteousness. I think, I think of my lawyers around the globe who wage a valiant battle putting their career on the line and devoting their full energy against a corrupt and hostile system that presumed my guilt from day one and was designed to break my spirit and coerce my confession. I also want to thank the human rights and criminal justice advocates globally and particularly in Japan who have fought tirelessly against insuperable odds to improve Japan's anachronistic and inhumane system of hostage justice. It is a system that is indifferent to the truth, indifferent to fairness and process, indifferent to fundamental civil liberties and accepted norms of justice. I also want to take a moment to mention Greg Kelly, an honorable man, husband and father, who was brutally torn from his word and his family on that November day, summoned to Tokyo under false pretenses by Harinada when he needed to stay home for an important surgery. Greg remains a victim of the Japanese hostage justice system with no trial date inside 14 months after his arrest. While my plight has captured the headlines, we and you cannot forget Greg's ordeal and the pain he and family endure each day at the hands 
of the Japanese system. He is being punished precisely because he is honorable and refused to participate in a suspicious pre-bargaining agreement alongside Harinada and Onuma and probably many others. Thanks to the systematic leaking of false information and distorted information and the intentional withholding of exculpatory information by the prosecutor and by Nissan, I was presumed guilty before the eyes of the world and subject to a system whose only objective is to coerce confessions, secure guilty pleas without regard to the truth. I have come to learn that my unimaginable ordeal over the past 14 months is the result of a handful of unscrupulous vindictive individuals at Nissan, at the Latam and Watkins law firm with the support of the Tokyo prosecutor office. It is important for me to emphasize that I'm not above the law and I welcome the opportunity for the truth to come out and to have my name vindicated and my reputation restored. I did not escape justice. I fled injustice and persecution, political persecution. Having endured more than 400 days of inhumane treatment in a system designed to break me and unwilling to provide me even minimal justice, I was left with no other choice but to protect myself and my family. It was a difficult decision and a risk one only takes if resigned to the impossibility of a fair trial. With the strings being pulled and manipulated by those dead set on securing a confession or a conviction whose only goal is to save face. The facts, the truth, justice are irrelevant to these individuals. This was the most difficult decision of my life. But let us not forget that I was facing a system where the conviction rate is 99.4%. And I will bet you that this number is much higher for the foreigners. The legitimacy of a justice system should not rest on its conviction rate, but instead on the confidence that it searches for and honors truth and dispenses fair and just outcomes. It is the prosecutors aided and abetted by petty, vindictive, and lawless individuals in government at Nissan and, and the Latam law firm who have destroyed and are destroying Japan reputation on the global stage. It is them who are fueling an archaic, manipulative, arbitrary side to an otherwise modern country. It is them who should be held accountable. The charges against me are baseless. Why do you think the prosecutors have leaked false information to the press against the Japanese law? Why have they intentionally concealed exculpatory evidence that support my innocence? We're going to see it. Why have they continually delayed the still undetermined, 13 months after, the still undetermined trial date and extended the relentlessly the in investigation timeline? Why have they re-arrested me and seized all my legal defense documents? Why were they so intent on preventing me from talking and holding a press conference where I would set forth the facts and my side of the story? Why have they spent 14 months trying to break my spirit, banning me from all contact with my wife, and surveying my every move? Let me, before going to your question, and I know you have many, try to give you some answer. And I'm going to follow particularly five topics. The first topic is why all of this happened at the beginning. Why all of this happened? The second is how did it happen? I'm going to tell you a little bit of what I've been through for 14 months. Third is we're going to come back to the four charges that the prosecutor have put on me. And I'm going to explain to you the charges. We're going to also talk about all the charges that have been at the base of what I call the smear campaign, that the prosecutor didn't dare even put them in the accusation, but they are flying through the media with many fantasist interpretation, and unfortunately with some official position which are absolutely not rigorous on them. 
And finally, I'm going to deal with some words about the lines Renault and Nissan. Where are they today, one year later? What is the situation of, the three, of these three entities one year later? And then I will let you answer all your questions. So let me start with the first item, which is why? Okay, if we say, okay, this is a plot, and this is something which has been organized, why? What are the reasons for this? Well, we have uh, two reasons. There are probably many, but I'm going to give you the main one. The two main reasons for this to happen. The first one was the fact that Nissan performance unfortunately started to decline at the beginning of 2017. I will remind you that in October 2016, I have decided to remove myself from the operation of Nissan because I signed the deal with Mitsubishi, taking control of 34% of Mitsubishi, and Mitsubishi needed help. So I moved to Mitsubishi as chairman of the board, as future chairman of the board, to support Masuko-san into reviving this company. And I told Saikawa-san, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna propose you as co-CEO. Yeah, but well, this is also something we should say. The CEOs are not no named by their predecessor. They are named by the board. They are proposed by the predecessor, but it is the board decision. So when people say, oh, Monsieur Bolloré was named by Mr. Gon, wrong. Mr. Bolloré was named by the board. He was proposed by Carlos Gon, but he was named by the board. So when they say, oh, he was named by Mr. Gon, that means he has no legitimacy. It's dead wrong. It's not factual. The members of the board of Renault voted unanimously, unanimously to nominate him as CEO. And nine months later, that unanimously voted him down. That's the reality. So let's come back to our story about Saikawa. Nominated in October 2016, CEO of the company. I moved to Mitsubishi. I told him now, it's your turn. I promise that one day I will return this company after having been CEO for 17 years. After having been CEO for 17 years of a dead company in 1999. I left with him $20 billion in cash. A company which was profitable, which was growing, which was respected. A brand which was nowhere in 1999, which became one of the top 60 brands in the world. That's what I left with him. I told him, you take care of it, now it's your turn. Let me help Mitsubishi, let me take care of Renault, and let me take care of the lines. Unfortunately, you know, a CEO is here as long as he performs. I, mean, I didn't stay 17 years head of Nissan, because I was Carlos Ghosn. I was there only because I was performing. I was delivering growth, I was delivering profit, I was delivering cash flow, I was delivering dividends. That's our reason to be. Unfortunately, we started in 17 to see a decline in the performance of the company. <coughs> Obviously, many tough discussions. In 2018, another decline, many tough discussions. But at the same time, he was the CEO and he was responsible for it. So he has to find the solution with his own team. So there was some nervousness in the ranks of the top management, and particular ranks in the top management, that at a certain point in time, patience will run out and change will come. That's number one. Number two, well, we have to come back to the history of the lines. You know, there was a famous Florence Law in France that has been voted, given double voting rights for uh, the shareholders who have more than two years. We, as board of Renault, opposed this rule. And we have the right, because the law allowed us, if there is more than two-thirds of the shareholders voting to pass over this rule, it was possible. We didn't prevail because, as you know, the French state increased its stake into the company, blocked the majority of two-thirds, we have most of the shareholders with us, but we were not able to reach the, 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 the two-thirds of the shares. This left a big bitterness with our friends in Japan. Not only with our, the management of Nissan, but also with the government of Japan. And this left a big stage because somehow they considered that it is unfair that Nissan, who owns 15% of shares in Renault, has zero voting right and that the French state, which owns 15% of Renault, has double voting rights. We tried to explain it. We were not successful, unfortunately. And this is where the problem started. 
because there started to be some kind of defiance from our Japanese colleagues, not only about the lines, but also about me, particularly when I've been asked before renewing my mandate, which by the way, I didn't ask for. I was ready to retire before June 2018. I was asked that I was the, probably the best person to continue for the next step of the lines. And unfortunately, I accepted this offer. And probably one of the reasons for which I'm in this situation today is because I accepted this offer to continue to integrate the two companies, converge the two companies, always respecting the autonomy of each company because this is a management belief that you're not going to make a strong company with people who are thinking they are second-rate citizens in a big organization. I want the Japanese to be proud of Alliance. I want Renault to be proud of the Alliance. I didn't want a first-rate citizen and a second-rate citizen. I want each company to be totally, and there was a system, I proposed a system to maintain that even though I made the Alliance irreversible. Unfortunately, there was no trust. And some of our Japanese friends thought the only way to get rid of the influence of Renault on Nissan is to get rid of me which unfortunately they were right, because when you see exactly what's happening today, where uh, Renault has very little influence on what's going on in Nissan, even though they put a nice face on what's, what's, what's taking place, you know exactly that the Japanese have the right analysis by saying, we get rid of him, we will get much more autonomy for Nissan. Unfortunately, as you know, we're gonna talk about the results. The results that were expected are not the one that uh, everybody was hoping for. So, who are the people? I promise you a name, I'm gonna give you names, okay? Who was part of the plot? Obviously, Saikawa is part of the plot. Harinada is part of the plot, obviously, and Onuma, because they showed. But there are many other people. Toyoda, member of the board, was the link between the board of Nissan, Nissan, and the authorities. Now, I can talk about what happens in the government of Japan. I can give you names, I know them. But I am in Lebanon, I respect Lebanon, and I respect the hospitality that has extend, been extended to me by the authorities in Lebanon. And in no way I want to do anything or say anything that would make their task more difficult. So I'm imposing on myself silence on this part of the presentation because in no way I want to show anything or say anything that would hurt the interest of the Lebanese people or the Lebanese government. So I will stop there for the government. Kawaguchi, Imazu, chief auditor, Toyoda, these are the main people. Obviously there are many other people participating to it, but I have all the names I'm limiting to the, to the, to the main people who are involved. The, the prosecutor, uh, I will mention some of the names, you're gonna have the people who have been from all the side of the fences, like uh, the uh, lawyer uh, company, uh, uh, LW, that Nissan, that we were using in the past and continue to help Nissan, even though attacking some of the advice that they have given us when we were in charge, and now they are supporting the new team. So the story is very long, but I'm gonna limit myself. How? Decline of the performance of Nissan, suspicion about the next step of the irreversibility of the lines. These are the two reasons for which this happened. How? I was arrested on November 19, 2018. I didn't suspect anything. And I didn't suspect anything because I was not anymore the CEO of the company, I was chairman. And now I delegate, I delegate. <coughs> Some people ask me, oh my God, that means you didn't look at this, you didn't mention this, you didn't suspect this. And it happened that it was a colleague, one of your colleagues from the US, and I say, you know, what happened in Pearl Harbor? Did you see Pearl Harbor happening? Did you see Pearl Harbor happening? Did you notice what happened in Pearl Harbor? You know, so you're telling me, you're asking me how did I notice? And I was not even in my country that something like this was being cooked against me. And you're telling me how I didn't, not, I didn't notice it. And I didn't notice it because it is true that when it's planned and it's confidential and it's secret, 
Well, it happens, and you'll be surprised, and I was surprised. There was a stage arrest. I've been told, I didn't know, that the world was led to know that I was arrested in the airplane. Bullshit. I was arrested in the airport. I came down from the airplane, I was taken in a car, I arrived to the passport, they told me there's a problem with my visa, they took me in a small room, and this is where I found Seki prosecutor telling me, I'm from the prosecutor office, I need to talk to you, and since then say, you cannot use any more your phone, and I know I was arrested, I don't understand what's going on. And because I was surprised, I told him, okay, can I at least give a phone call to Nissan to send a lawyer? Well, obviously, I didn't know that Nissan was behind it. And it was all staged way before between the prosecutor and the company. This is the way it happened. And from there, they took me to Kosugi Detention Center. It took five hours between my arrest and me finding myself into a tiny cell in Kosugi. The collusion between Nissan and the prosecutor is everywhere. The only people who don't see it, maybe, are the people in Japan. They don't see this collusion. And I've been told this is totally illegal. How can it be illegal? And at the same time, we have so many traces, so many hands on the wall, and nobody's talking about them. Well, you don't see if you don't want to see. But the collusion between Nissan and the prosecutor is coming through witnesses who were in the headquarters of Nissan, who told me exactly what happened before I was arrested, all the preparation, all the visits, a lot of the meeting that took place between the prosecutors and Nissan, at least without counting officials. And, and I'm not gonna talk about the official, as I said. So, I was sent to the prison, and the prosecutor told me, well, we're gonna arrest you for under-reporting your compensation. I was shocked at the beginning. Frankly, I, I, I couldn't understand that. I say, a comp what compensation? And he said, yeah, yeah, we are arresting you for under-reporting a compensation that was not paid to you. Second surprise. Okay, so we're talking about something which was not paid for me. Yes. And then something which didn't go to the board, which means that it did not decided. So I was arrested for a compensation that was not fixed, that was not decided, and that was not paid. This is the reason of my arrest. This is the reason of my arrest. Well, I can tell you that in many countries, there is no reason to arrest. It's certainly not a criminal case. It's certainly not a, even an offense. Give you a name you know very well. Tanaka-san, professor of corporate law, Tokyo University, consulted three weeks ago by my lawyers. They put everything, now that we have the documents, at least on the first charge from the prosecutor, again, 13 months after the arrest, we showed him everything and we told him, Professor, please tell us. He said, I'm quoting him, it is a shame that Japan arrested Mr. Gon for this. Say, so we asked him to write and he's gonna write Obviously, I don't know if he's gonna to continue to write it now, but he said, it's a shame, Professor Tanaka, University of Tokyo, corporate law. It's a shame that Mr. Gon was arrested for this. Let me continue. So, in, let me talk to you, and a little bit, I'm not gonna to talk too much about it. 130 days in prison, solitary confinement, tiny cell without window, light day and night. 30 minutes per day, excluding weekend, because obviously there is not enough guard in the weekend, you can't go for 30 minutes outside. When there is a holiday, there is nobody. So you stay in your cell, you just get your food. For example, six days without any human contact during the New Year break. Shower twice a week, try to ask to have more, they said no. Prescribed medication is forbidden. You can get only the medicine from the prison. Interrogated days and night. It can happen in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, up to eight hours, obviously without the presence of a lawyer. All of this is taped. Impossible to take to anyone, no one speak English or French or anything. When we need something important, we have to bring somebody and this guy is available once a week. Presumption of guilt prevail. Prosecutor from the beginning, you know, they let me to know you're guilty. You know, don't play games, confess. 
And everything they were asking me is not to try to discover the truth, it's to try to find reason to make sure that their accusation will be stronger. So I felt from the beginning that there was no interest into finding the truth. Every day was interested into trying to build a very strong case against me. And sent back to prison the day before the press conference to stop me from speaking out. Which is interesting is that after I was bailed out the second time, a new prosecutor in Japan has been nominated, and he was interviewed by the Japanese media. And Japanese media said, Ma, Mr. Prosecutor, why do you forbid Mr. Gong to talk to the press? He said, oh, no, we don't. We don't. He can't talk to the press. But we also can bring new charges, which was a, a very simple message that, okay, yes, sure, he can talk to the press, but watch and we can bring new charges. And they're very good at bringing charges because, as you know, yesterday, what a coincidence, yesterday, obviously they can't put me back in prison, but they asked, they put a warrant arrest for my wife yesterday. On what? On declaration she made nine months ago in front of the judge and with the prosecutor. And what is the reason? They said, oh, we suspect she said something which was wrong. Nine months later? You discovered this nine months later? One day before this press conference? What a coincidence. What a coincidence. This is exactly the way it works. You talk, you go back to Kosugi. Nine months separated from my wife without any motive. Carol has a lot of courage. After I've been arrested, she left the country. Prosecutor asked her, why are you leaving the country? Well, obviously, they took her passport, they were very threatening, they left her without a telephone, they got her computer. She was left alone in Tokyo without anything. She left because she was afraid. But then when they start to say, oh, she has something to hide, she came back. Four days later, she flew back. They interrogated her in front of the court with the judge and the prosecutor. And then she left. And now they're issuing a warrant for false testimony nine months later. Let me give you another example. The judge in charge of the bail condition, Hajime Shimada, we asked him seven times to remove the ban over a period of nine months, seven times. <coughs> and every time he took the time to think, nothing changed, huh? And then he came back by saying no. And why no? Because tampering of evidence. Tampering of evidence for Carol. But I was able to receive my sisters. I was able to receive my kids. I was able to receive my cousins, my friends. So if I was intending to tamper evidence, I could tamper evidence with anybody. Why, Carol? Because they knew that by not allowing me to have a normal life, they were breaking me. And which is interesting is when we tell Shimada-san, Shimada-san, you know, maybe they can meet from time to time under your control. And the question was very interesting. It was saying, why do they want to meet? And we said, okay, how about a Zoom, a conference? He said, what do I want to talk about? I felt like I was not a human anymore. I was something between a human, an animal, or an object. But I mean, there is no feeling that a man and a woman who are married want to talk together, and I have to explain why I have to talk to my wife? I didn't care. And the answer, as you know, was no. And I had the right for two hours, two hours in nine months, with a lawyer present in the room, and the poor guy was embarrassed. He, 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 he just tell me, please excuse me, I have to be here, and I have to report about what did you say to your wife. That's what you're talking about. The second one that I would like to mention also, I mentioned I had many pre-trial sessions. In the pre-trial session, you have the prosecutor, you have the defense, and you have the judge. Three judges. Well, I was naive. I thought that the judge was a boss. Well, I was wrong. The boss was the prosecutor. The judge, Kenji Shimotsu, very nice guy, very polite. But the prosecutor did whatever they want. When they were late, they say, well, sorry, we're late. We're busy. When they ask, why don't you bring this document this day? They say, we're going to think about it. Then the date comes, they say, we're late. We're not giving it. And why all of this? Try as much as possible to delay the trial. 
And when I left Japan, I still did not have a date for the first charge, didn't have a date for the first charge. Then they came with the idea about saying, oh, we cannot put all the trials at the same time. You have to finish the first charge before we start the second one. So when I asked my lawyers about how much time is all, all of this going to take, saying we're afraid you're going to be maybe five years in Japan before I get a judgment. Five years in Japan. This is, I understand, we have Maître Zimri, who is here, who is a specialist in human rights. Speedy trial is one of the basic and most fundamental rights of any human being, part of the treaty of human rights. Well, I was far from a speedy trial. On the contrary, I had the impression that they can take as much time as possible. And, you know, with the judge being a kind of nice organizer of the whole things and the prosecutor calling the shots. 99.4% conviction rate, all the signs that there was no way I was going to be treated fairly, no sign that I will have a normal life for the next four or five years. So I can tell you, that means it's not very difficult to come to conclusion, you're going to die in Japan or you're going to have to get out. This was not about justice. This was, as I felt, I was a hostage of a country that I have served for 17 years. I dedicated my professional life. I was proud of it. I revived a company that nobody else before me was able to do for 10 years. They were in the dirt. I brought them. For 17 years, I was considered as a role model in Japan. More than 20 books of management were written about me. And like this in, in a minute, all of a sudden, a few prosecutors and a bunch of executives in this town say, you know what? This guy is a cold, cold, greedy dictator. That's what I said. Cold, greedy dictator. We filed motion to dismiss because of the, all the elements that the prosecutor violated. Obviously, this motion is still being analyzed. And then there is an endless search for new charges by the prosecutor. So in a certain way, you know, I, I think we have the list. Yeah, we have here the list of all the prosecutor misconducts that have been presented with evidence and with uh, facts and with data and with name and with testimony that were presented to the court just to ask for the case to be dismissed. But my lawyers in Japan told me, you know, <coughs> don't think that it will be dismissed. There is zero case in Japan where whatever is the reason of dismissal, a case was dismissed. Some people were acquitted, it's part of the 0.6% left, but there is zero case of dismissal. Let me go now to the accusation. The first accusation is the underreporting. This is the main accusation for which I was arrested. Again, amount of money not fixed, not decided, not paid. What's interesting also, I'm going to give you some interesting facts, is that Nissan pleaded guilty in Japan by saying, oh, we're sorry, we're going to provision 9 billion yen recently, and we're going to plead guilty in Japan. And they India asked to pay a fine. Good citizen. The problem is that in Tennessee, where there is a lawsuit against them, they took the opposite position. Their lawyer said, well, we're not guilty. There is no reason. There is no reason. And this document is available for you. In Japan, we're guilty. That's what Nissan says. In Tennessee, they said, we're not guilty. So this document is available. We are sublined. The, the, key, the key sentences saying that, I just wanted to mention this for you, and we'll come back during the question, uh, the question and answer. And again, there is no democratic country I know where you go for jail for this kind of accusation, even if they were right. <coughs> Shinsei Bank. Shinsei Bank, there is a resolution from the board. This is a board resolution. Interesting, in the board resolution, everybody voted unanimously 
for a resolution saying if a foreign director or a foreign, foreign officer foreign officer want to have a contract of exchange rate to cover his income, he can do it at no cost for the company. Who was present? Well, some people you know. Carlos Savares was member of the board. You have Saikawa, member of the board. They all signed on this. No cost for the company. Very good. I benefited from it. No cost for the company. No cost for the company. No loss for the company. Again, we return by saying, where is the problem? Where is the problem? We continue. Jufali. Ah, this is another one. Where well, they say, ah, Mr. Gohan, Jufali didn't do nothing. He received $14.7 million from Nissan on four years, but he didn't do nothing. This is the accusation. He didn't do nothing. Well, uh, we have a contract. We found finally, we got the contract about what Jufali was doing. What are the documents that were signed between Jufali and many executives inside Nissan? But particularly, I want to attract your attention to the fact that, you know, there have been a lot of articles saying, you know, CEO reserve. Oh, my God, this is the kind of secret money that Carlos Ghosn, you know, opened a safe, has a lot of cash, distributed to his friend. He can do whatever he wants. CEO reserve is a line in the budget. That's what it is. You can access CEO reserve, but it is a line in the budget. It has no payment, it's no cash, it's nothing at all. This is one indication of the CEO reserve. How does it go? You have a vice president asking for the money. In this case, it's Gilles Normand, who was the head of the region. Then he has to explain why he wants the money and what is the contract which is based. And then you have many people reviewing it and agreeing on it or not. Well, obviously you have legal, then you have the controller, then you have the boss of this guy, who usually is the head of the operation, then there is me. Why? Because if it's called CEO Reserve, I have to accept that. Every single payment from CEO Reserve follow the same procedure. There is not one dollar paid from CEO Reserve with my signature alone. You have all these people signing on, and, and after this, after you agree on the budget line, then it has to go for the payment. And when you go for the payment, you have many other people having to sign. Local controller, local vice president, uh, obviously the people receiving the money, etc., etc. So all this farce, talking about CO reserve as a kind of being special things where Carlos Ghosn was taking money, giving it to his friend, it doesn't stand one minute. We have all the evidence showing that. We have all the documents, fortunately now, because you know, when I was arrested, they took everything from me. I had no computer, no file, no in Renault or in Nissan, nothing. Everything was taken. So I have to reconstitute everything, everything to defend myself. And obviously, I'm using here some of the documents that the prosecutor have at the end to deliver to us in order to allow us to defend ourselves. We also, I would like to show you, um, can we move to Ananda Sass, uh, to the declaration of different people? Yeah. Then, then we have a lot of statements. Prosecutors in Japan have been visiting many people making statements. Never heard about them. We heard about them because they were obliged to give it to them. One of the important statements is Gilles Normand. Why Gilles Normand? He was the vice president in charge of the Middle East for Nissan. Another one is Joe Peter. Joe Peter was the chief financial officer of Nissan. Another one is Alain Dassas, also another chief financial officer. They covered all these areas. And when we look at what they are saying in all these documents, and these documents are available. You can consult them, and we make them available for those who want to look at them. So when we are uh, looking at that, what do they say? They say the Middle East was an important region for Carlos Ghosn because Toyota is, is one of the main profit center of Toyota, and it's not one of the main profit center of Nissan. And as you know, the Middle East is practically an Asian country. The cars selling are Japanese cars and Korean cars. And then obviously you have some Mercedes and BMW, but the European have practically no position in the Middle East, or very weak position. I'm talking particularly about the Gulf. So I want to push the people to say, okay, let's go on the offensive. We have an opportunity, not only in volume, but also in profit. And we need to change the way we do business. We need to innovate in, in, in the way we do business. Pushing people to partner with the local dealer, that's what Toyota does. They don't have their own bureaucrats going into the region trying to do what they do. They say, no, no, we have a good dealer. Let's work with him. Let's give him support. Let's give him incentive. Let him do the job for us. And frankly, it delivered for us. Because every time we did this, we had higher sales, 
and higher profits. All of this is argumented. And the presentation made by the uh, prosecutor is, oh, Mr. Ghan has special ties with the uh, Saudi guy and with Ahmad Bahwan and Suhail Bahwan in Oman. So they had this kind of very cozy relationship. Well, in fact, everything we did with Oman, we did it with Dubai, we did it with Lebanon, we did it with Qatar. They're not talking about the other one. They're just focusing on, oh, these incentives are very big. And what's interesting is when you compare the incentive paid to these people, it's totally normal. And even below the level of incentive that competitors are seeing. But this is something you never heard about. Potential of the Middle East is very important. And that's what we were going after. Ahmed Bawan, let's go to the next one, has been viewed by the prosecutor, never heard about it, huh? He was reviewed by the prosecutor in Japan. He was interrogated for one day. Never heard about it. Why? Because obviously, <laughs> he didn't say what they are expecting him to say. He denied all of the accusation. And he denied all the accusation, knowing that obviously nobody's going to believe him. They're going to say, yeah, but if you are accomplice, well, in a certain way, you may say something different than the truth. But you need to know that all the bank accounts, my bank accounts, Bahwan bank accounts, Kumar bank accounts, Jufali bank accounts have all been swept, all of them. All bank accounts in the world. So if there was any, any payment which was suspicious, I can tell you, it would be front page of the Nikkei or of the Sankei before it will come, it will come directly with the, by the prosecutor. So then people say, okay, so what is the story with Kumar? Well, I say, well, if a breach of trust is there is a money from Nissan going from Nissan and ended up with you, but there is no money from Nissan because the money in Nissan stops at Suhail Bahwan Automotive, period. And Kumar has nothing to do with it. And we have all the evidence of that, that there was absolutely no transfer indicating that there was any money from Nissan benefiting Kumar. Uh, so, end of the road. There's no breach of trust because breach of trust is there is money of the company which is benefiting the executive of the company. I'm sure we'll come back on this. So let's continue on character assassination. This is, I must say that they've been very successful. As you know, Nissan hired a lot of people. I read in Bloomberg recently that they spent more than $200 million for the investigation and for everything around this, $200 million to get how much money? How much money is that say? They're talking about $14.7 million with Jufali that was paid to Jufali and $5 million for Bahwan. So how is, how rationally you're gonna say, you're gonna spend $200 million. You're gonna destroy your company. You're gonna destroy your brand. You're gonna destroy your image. You're gonna divert the attention of all your top management. You're taking a big risk with the alliance. And by the way, the market cap decrease of Nissan since my arrest is more than $10 billion. They lost more than $40 million a day during all this period. By the way, Renault is not better because the market cap of Renault went down since my arrest by more than 5 billion euro, which means 20 million euro a day of quotation. 20 million euro a day. So when I hear a statement made by a French official saying, we need to concentrate on the 11 million euro of undefined expenses. I say, yes, sure. Why don't you come to me? I have explained to you. Nobody came to me. You make an audit. But the first person that should be, the, if for the audit to be valid, the contradictory of it, you should come to the main person and ask him the question. If you're not convinced by the question, then it's fine. But you even come to me to tell me about the planes, about the help to universities, the help to school. You know, you are not come to me and you just say unexplained expenses. I don't worry about these 11 million euro because I have an explanation. I worry as a shareholder of Renault about the fact that I lost 35% of value and I still don't understand why. I worry when Renault goes down by all this amount, the automotive industry is up 12%. So the only companies which went down in market cap for this period of time are, what a coincidence, Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi. And everything else on average went up 12%. So why a company is made? It's what? It's about what? 
It's about, uh, you know, it's mainly it's about creation of value, if I remember. A CEO is here for the creation of value. A board is here to protect shareholders. Where are we here? Where I'm a little bit lost as a shareholder of Renault and a shareholder of Nissan. I say, oh my God, who's protecting me as a shareholder? Who is caring about me? Where is the name of the brand? Where's the future of the brand? Let's go to character assassination. Maybe the big story about Versailles. Versailles. Some people think I'm in prison because of Versailles. No, no, it's true. I mean, some people say, okay. First Versailles, first accusation, Mr. Gohan, you make a 15 years anniversary of the alliance in Versailles. Yes, sure. Why Versailles? It, Versailles is not Louis XIV. Versailles is the most visited site in France. It's a symbol of the genius that France has. It's a symbol of the opening to the world. It's the symbol of the globalization of France. You talk about Versailles, any foreigner will come to Versailles. They're amazed by the beauty, by the attraction, by the gardens. That's why we saw Versailles. It's not because you want to mimic Louis XIV or you want to mimic Marie Antoinette. It's ridiculous. We made it and they say, oh, this was the party of birthday. We say, well, hey, I made a speech. Where is the speech? The speech disappeared. All of a sudden, I can get the speech I made, which was a corporate speech where I thank all the people for the support they've given to the alliance. But people say, hey, but why the other executive of Renault and Nissan were not here? Well, it was not for the executive. We had a celebration with the executive, which was different. This was for the partners, and particularly with the foreign partners. If you invite somebody in France to go to Versailles, he doesn't care. But if you invite an American, a Chinese, a Japanese to go to Versailles, they all run. They all run. That's the reason of Versailles. But the suspicion is, hmm, this was a birthday party. Okay, character assassination. Second one, you have the unfortunate reservation of a room in Versailles. Can we, yeah, this is the bill. Who took care, that, that, let me tell you how it happened. We were big sponsors of Versailles. Why? Because you know that Versailles doesn't have enough money to maintain the building. So they go to a large corporation. They came to me and say, Mr. Gon, can you help us? I said, fine because the image of Versailles fits with the image of the lines, it fits with the image of Renault. Let's do it. I agree. So we supported many things in Versailles. We supported recently the fact that we have redone Le Salon de la Paix. It was in a situation which was, frankly, horrible. We paid more than one million euro. Well, hopefully it didn't come as a breach of trust that I'm using the money of the company for something in which Renault may not be interested. It didn't come. One million euro for the, for the, to redo the Salon de la Paix. So, the image of Versailles is this one. So Catherine Pega, who is the head of Versailles, told me, Mr. Gond, you're a big benefactor, you know, from time to time for our big friends, we can make rooms available. If you have a private party, we can make room available. I say, thank you very much. And then many months has passed. All of a sudden, I had the possibility for Carol's 50th birthday. She was telling me, okay, we need to have our friends coming from Lebanon and from the United States. I said, you know what? Maybe Versailles can be an interesting place. I had this proposal from Pega. Called Pega, she said, no problem. We put somebody in charge. Obviously, we're not going to do it. This is a company, CMP. CMP put all the expenses. We have them here. And then they put a rental of the room offered by Versailles. It's written on the document by the people who organize it. And they put zero euro. Okay, so you know, when I see this, I say, okay, it's a commercial gesture. You know, they are appreciative, etc. That's fine. We're gonna make their own traiteur work. We're gonna use their own people. Because obviously this is not a very cheap uh, party. So then I was surprised to see that this cost 50,000 euro because I don't know what happened behind the scene. Somebody went and said, no, you know what? We cannot pay 50,000. We cannot give as a present 50,000 euro. We're gonna deduct it from the credit that Renault earns by being a sponsor of Versailles. We said, okay, we're ready to pay. We didn't know. And we have all the documents to prove and all the people involved that we didn't know about it. Nobody tells us. We thought that in good faith, this was a kind of commercial gesture, which, by the way, benefiting Versailles because we use all the people who are working in Versailles. The houses, 
They say, oh, Mr. Gum, you have a house in Rio de Janeiro, house in Beirut, come on. Well, the houses all belong to Nissan. And say, oh my God, we are discovering this, you've done it secretly. Secretly? Let me show you the documents. This is a document signed by the two representative director of Nissan, Greg Kelly and Hiroto Saikawa, 2013. And what this document says, use of company residential accommodation, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Beirut, Lebanon. Use it. And they say also that as long as he's working for the company and we are committing that these houses can be sold back to him at book value at the end. So when I hear that everybody was surprised and we were doing this hidden, I say, oh my God. I mean, what kind of document you want more than this where you two representative director plus legal, finance, treasury, the re regional people who vote, who wrote this document, that means the whole thing doesn't make sense. Part of, by the way, this is not at, at all part of the charges, but this is part of the character assassination. The media jump on it. Let's continue. My sister Claudine, contract with my sister Claudine. They say, ah, this is also, they make a contract, she didn't do anything. Well, she didn't do anything. Well, one of the reasons for which she was there, because she was the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Rio de Janeiro, and she was key for really benefiting from a huge incentive package and selecting Rio de Janeiro for the building of a more than $1 billion plant in, in Resende, in Rio de Janeiro, which is, exists today in, in Nissan. So, we, all the doctors, who were aware? Well, two representative directors are aware. The head of the operation of Brazil was aware. All the people who wired the money, transferred the money, were aware of it. Obviously now, people say, yeah, we're not sure. I mean, when Saikawa was asked about, hey, by the way, you signed this document. He said, yeah, I signed it. I read it in the press. Huh? Probably he said something like, he said, but I didn't pay attention. Or I didn't understand why I was signing this. But this kind of argument with him goes well with the prosecutor. That don't go well with me, but they go well with him. So let me go to the last point, yeah, RNBV. RNBV audit made by Mazar. You know that they went with an interim audit report to the board of Renault, interim audit report. And after they've seen the interim audit report, Renault communicated and some official of the government communicated the results of an audit which is not finished before even I have the opportunity to interface with them. They had many questions for me. They had many questions for me, but they didn't even have the opportunity to ask me this. So this so-called audit, which is absolutely not contradictory, which is gonna be the object, if I understand very well, of a legal battle, well, it didn't follow any one of the rules of the audit, and the first element of an audit is the contradictory the fact that you are exposed to the results and you have to explain what's going on. This did not happen. And you know, we are treating Renault, Nissan, and RNBV as small pop and mom shops. Like there is no controller, there is no finance, there is no auditors, there is no outside people. All the bills are being reviewed, not only internally, but externally. All the explanations are being made. So people think that these kind of things can happen without anybody, you know, without anybody, just a couple of people signing on it. This follow a protocol which is extremely rigorous, and I can tell you, RNBV had the same protocol than Renault and Nissan. Let me go for the last point before probably making a, a break before going to your question and answer. Then you say, why all of this? What is the consequence of all of this? You know, it's difficult to know who, who's the winner of this. Who, who at the end of the day, who prevailed into this? Well, in 2017, the Alliance was the number one automotive group with three companies, Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi, growing, profitable, with a clear vision for the future, strategy, bold strategy, and you know very well that we were preparing to add Fiat Chrysler to the group because I was negotiating with John Elkan for Fiat Chrysler to join. So we had the strategy, we know where we were going, we know how the synergies work. This was the situation in 2017. We look today, well, frankly, there is no more alliance. 
And if somebody said, well, why you guys are together? Because it looks like all the decisions are made are consensual. When I've been managing this entity for 17 years, I can tell you consensus doesn't work. It doesn't work. You have to make sure that you force people to go for synergies. You make sure that they adhere to the synergies. You spend time to explain to them why the synergies are important. If you lead them to themselves and you say it's consensual, nothing happens. And by the way, we saw it in the results of the companies. So, the three companies, Alliance disappear, no longer works. And the three company, the growth has disappeared, profits are down. I'm a hard, finding a hard time to see any strategic direction. No more technological innovation coming, and no more. And on top of this, the line missed the unmissable, which is Fiat Chrysler. Le didn't go with the lines, they go with PSA. But it's unbelievable. How can you lose that? How can you lose this huge opportunity to become the dominant player in this industry by developing ties with people who were eager to join you, who were totally complementary to the alliance? Obviously, you're going to have 15 explanations telling you, you know what, it's because of gone, because, you know, this and that and that. Everything is on me now, okay? But it is unbelievable that this didn't happen. It's unbelievable. So, <clears throat> the... What I would like to say is, this is not a common case where you say, oh, Mr. Gohan, you know what? You know, he didn't, uh, and, and the media, sometimes they say he didn't pay taxes, no taxes involved. You know, he hidden compensation. When I tell people I didn't receive any compensation, they are surprised. But the whole story has been put in a way to lead people to think something which is different from the reality. Okay, and it, I must admit, they are very good at it. This is probably the only way. This is the only thing on which they are good. Because on everything else, which is the raison sociale of a car maker, is to make good cars, sell a lot of them, develop the technology, see the car of the future, make a profit, make cash, pay a good dividend, and increase the shareholder. Yeah. They said, we want to turn the gone page. Well, they've been very successful. They turned the gone page. They turned the gone page because there is no more growth, there is no more increase of profit, there is no more strategic initiatives, there is no more technology, and there is no more alliance. What we see today is a masquerade of an alliance that obviously with all the people who are involved is not going to go anywhere. So that's why I'm telling you this is political, this is political. There is a lot of tentative to present it as a you know, common case of somebody who has crossed boundaries. No, there is no crossing of boundaries. I am innocent of all the charges, all of them. And I can prove it now because I start to have a lot of documents and there are many more documents to come. And that's what I wanted to say, to, uh, to say today. I left Japan because I wanted justice. That's why I left Japan. I didn't run from justice. I want justice. Because justice is the only way I'm going to establish my reputation. And the only way what I've done during my life is going to be recognized to its value. And if I can't, don't get it in Japan, I'm going to get it somewhere else. Thank you for your attention. And um, now uh, let me, before... Uh, before we make the we make the the break, just final point, particularly for our Japanese friend. I was painted in the media in in, in Japan, cold, greedy dictator. That's it. Everything is cold, greedy dictator. Cold, saying he doesn't like Japan. He doesn't like Japanese. He's a kind of mercenary here for the money. It's wrong. I like Japan. I like the people in Japan. I can tell you that for the many months where I was on bail, I was walking everywhere in Tokyo alone. I had no bodyguard. I went to restaurants. I went to movie, And people were greeting me. They were telling me, Gambate kudasai, Gonsan. They were saying, we're sorry about happening to you. We hope you continue to love Japan. This is the people on the street. Because the people on the street do not think one second that after celebrating this guy, this guy Jean, for 17 years, all of a sudden, he became a villain. They don't understand it. They don't believe it. They don't even understand the accusation. 
So, and when they say I don't love Japan, let's make some history, a little bit of history. I, see, I revived Nissan. I went back, uh, we crossed the financial crisis together. When the tsunami hit Japan, I was the first foreigner to come back to Japan. If you remember, I was the first one. Because it happened that I was in France on an executive committee. I was the first foreigner to come back in Japan when everybody was leaving Japan. And I was the first one to dare going to Iwaki plant, which was near Fukushima. Because in Fukushima, if you remember, you had the nuclear leaks. And nobody dared to go to Iwaki because of the nuclear leaks. I had to go by myself and call the suppliers and call the employees to say, we're going to rebuild the plant together. I have my kids in Japan, educated in Japan. I lived in Japan. I refused to abandon Nissan only because I cared about the country and they cared about the company. So I'm asking one question. I'm not cold toward Japan. I love Japan. Why Japan is paying me with evil for the good I think I've done to the country? I don't understand that. I profoundly don't understand that. Because I know Japanese people are not like this. The second thing is they're greedy. They say I'm greedy. I'm greedy. In, 19, in 2009, Steve Ratner, who was Obama car czar, General Motors was down, Chrysler was down, he came to me and said, I talked to the president, we want you to become the CEO of General Motors. He, wrote, he has written this in his book, so I'm not telling you stories. You can, you can look at the book. And he was offering me a pay which was double my pay. I said, you know what, I understand your offer is very attractive, but a captain of a ship doesn't leave the ship when the ship is in difficulty. This is not a greedy guy talking. A greedy guy would say, sorry guys, this is business, I'm going to go for my own interest. And frankly, I made a mistake. I recognize it today. I should have offered, I should have accepted the offer. But I have my beliefs and I, offer, uh, and I followed my beliefs. Then, so, this is about greedy. The third thing is about uh, dictator. Well, did I discover I'm a dictator in 2018? For 2007, for 17 years, I'm a CEO of the company. I had 20 books. You have so many professors coming. I have so many cases in Harvard, Stanford, INSEAD, HSA, WASEDA, KU, all of them coming, all the professors analyzing this. Nobody. Nobody discovered I was a dictator? All these people who have made the analysis, have made all the cases, nobody had a doubt that I was a dictator? This whole thing, which was very elegantly fabricated, imposed on the Japanese public. But you know what? The public did not react in function of what they said. Because I told you, I didn't have a bodyguard. I walked in Japan all the time by myself or one of my kids, we have never been bothered by anybody. We have always be been received very well in all the restaurants and the places that we have visited. But I tarnished my reputation in, any, and in many other countries where the fact that you have power or you're supposed to have money, you're already guilty. Well, it was not the same treatment, as you know. We're going to stop here and make a... Yeah, a small break. Oh, well, I can continue, but maybe. We're just going to do a break for those who want um, audio translations. We're going to provide uh, some audio translation. So please ask for it because Mr. Gunn will be answering questions. Asked in Arabic, in Arabic, questions in English, in English, and questions in French, in French. Thank you very much. And question in Portuguese, in Portuguese. Sure. Now, Brazil, in France. Yes. Yeah. 